Fast Track Live Grad Clinic. I'm off site. It's the summer. I'm at my personal family home streaming to you, but don't want to miss a beat because this is your opportunity to get live help and support from me on your projects. And the reason we created this community, Fast Track, is because so many of you have struggled like I did as a grad student. You've hit bumps on the road, uh, you've hit every landmine possible, some of you feel burnt out, like you're going in circles, you don't know what to do, don't know where to turn to, and that's why we created this critical community of free and valuable support uh, for those of you. And I, I mean, for me, this is something we do out, out of the joy to avoid you having that same hardship that leads some of you in the worst case to just completely abandon hope and give up, missing out on the critical investment that you're making in yourself. Um, what I've got today for you, you're going to want to stick around to the end of the session because we're going to cover a lot of valuable things. E even if it's not directly what you're working on, you're going to learn a lot of valuable principles and techniques that you can apply today. We're going to look at a manuscript that a student uh, sent uh, that contains the nuts and bolts of research proposal, we're going to apply our gift method to show you how the, a tool that you can use today to test that your research proposal is on point. This is invaluable for anybody who wants to take a research project forward. If you don't have clarity on the four elements of our gift method, there's something missing and you need to revise what you're doing. And if you get that right at the beginning, it's going to save you hardship later. We're going to look at a submission on linear regression. I have a student who's been feeling really confused about how to interpret and present findings from linear regression. Um, and again, the, the principles we're going to use in setting that up are going to be the same principles for setting up any kind of data you're looking at, whether that's qualitative or quantitative, um, to have clarity about your research. Uh, because the research itself is complicated enough to get lost in methodological details. We want you to have clarity on the principles of the analysis you're applying and how to present it. And that's going to apply irrespective of whatever method you use. We have some students asking questions uh, about productivity, about procrastination. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're also going to talk a little bit about comparing uh, conventional and systematic reviews. So really fun session. There's going to be a lot of value here um, and want you to stick around to check it out. We've also put together a literature review guide. I've linked here in a QR that covers some of the most common pitfalls that we've seen students make when doing their literature reviews um, with suggestions on how to overcome them. It also explains a little bit about how some of our step-by-step -step guides that you can find in the group work. Um, and as ever, many of you ask, how can you reach me? I'm at David Stuckler at FastTrackGrad.com. You can also find me in the DMs. If you haven't joined our Facebook group already, you need to do that now right away. You're going to get a ton of value out of that group. Um, and it's the best way for us to directly be in touch. Um, and again, that's our Facebook group, um, uh, Fast Track Grad. All right, let me dive straight in as ever. I'm checking the chat and DMs as we go. So if you have anything that comes to mind, we always like to take submissions in advance and we give priority to those. Um, but if something does come to mind um, that maybe uh, you didn't think about before, you didn't send to us, you know, I always try to go through the chat and co cover for you your questions now because I don't want you to ever feel stuck. If you're feeling stuck, it means we're not doing our job. Um, and I may not be able to get to all of them, but I do come back after and uh, we'll reach out directly to you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, the first one I want to take, I'm going to take a submission of a, a research proposal that was sent to me. So hopefully this works. If you guys are struggling to uh, see um, see this, then uh, let me let me know. But I'm going to share this um, this submission that that we have right here. Let me get this out. And uh, thanks again. You know, when you share this with us, it really does a great service to the whole community. Um, okay, so you should be able to see this now. And I'll make it a little bit bigger. If you can't see it, please do let me know in the chat. Okay, so here we got a case study being proposed in uh, Suk Aras City, looking at the association between urban physical attributes of recreational open spaces. So, um, already I can see a few things that make me worried. This is, uh, I want to see in your title, I, I like this in the title, that we've got clarity that we're doing a case study uh, of this city. Um, but even saying in a developing country, we've clarified this, I want you guys to write for an international audience. 
So uh, we have people who are geographically challenged, uh, myself included. And if you ask me, where is this city? Unfortunately, uh, I'm, a, I'm ashamed to admit, at first glance, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. So we need to know what the country is. Assume basically that your readers, your supervisors are, are going to be dumb. You're going to need that to publish well in an international audience. You need to keep the things that should be simple as simple as possible because the research is complex enough. The other thing I want is I want it to scream high value, that this is really important. There's a debate here. And to me, to say association between urban and physical attributes, it um, doesn't exactly... I, I know you're probably very passionate about your topic. I want you to convey that passion. But to me, if you say association between urban and physical attributes, I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm already getting sleepy. Uh, I mean, it is the morning over here. I've got, I've got my coffee. But I think we can do better. Um, so I want to see a research question that that really comes out and emerges in your title. There's a relationship that you're exploring that's really important. Weaker types of research tend to be those that are very exploratory. And and my colleagues would always knock these and say, well, you're just kind of going on a fishing expedition. You don't know what you're looking for. You're trying to catch something. I'd rather have you more be a little bit clearer and say, do you want to catch tuna? Do you want to catch sea bass? Uh, you have a clear mission, clear purpose. So many of you are doing this research for a reason. Right? You're taking a sacrifice to invest in yourself to do something you're really passionate about. Right? If you wanted to go make a whole lot of money, you'd go do an MBA or go down a business path. Many of you are doing this because you want to contribute to the public good. So make that clear. Um, and, and by the way, this is one of the things I really love about this community, that so many of you are committed to the, the public good. I'm just going to check, make sure in the chats that nothing's uh, funny is going on here. Oh, hey, Tal. Good to see you. Algier. Hey, Algier. I forgot. Don't, don't worry. It's just the principle here is don't assume that your readers readers are going to know. Okay, so let, let's take a look. So we're going to draw on a few elements that may be familiar to you, and we have dedicated trainings on. So if something's not clear, let me know, and I'll set you up with the right training. We've got training on, on effective writing, and especially here uh, on the GIFT method. So the GIFT method, just want to take a step back for a second and um, talk about that. And I'm just going to write it here because it's just going to be, well, maybe I can draw here. Let me see if I can draw. And um, I'm going to mark up your paper so don't get too mad at me. Um, but in, in, in a friendly way, the, the, the students I work with tell me that I can be, uh, fierce, but loving, which I kind of take as a compliment. Um, so, all right, let's see if I can draw. Okay. So we're going to have something called a gift method gift, right? And this method, um, it, 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 it's kind of what it sounds. Gift is your research is your gift to the world, right? I know it's kind of cute and, but, but I, it, it sticks with you. So G is for the gap. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what gap this paper is trying to address. So I'm not even going to read it. I want to make sure that the gap is clear. So let's scroll down and find the gap. Okay. So um, this is good. No, this is nice. There's a lack of studies in developing countries. So this is saying we've got a, a gap here. This is good. Um, this is, so this is very clear. So this is the main gap that I'm seeing so far. Um, Algeria, very few studies in Algeria, and the, uh, the gap is Algeria. So this is okay. So as a gap, this is a good gap in saying that, well, the studies from developed countries might not apply to developing countries where the situation is particularly acute. I think that is perfectly viable as a gap. It may not be the strongest uh, way to justify a gap. I think the stronger gaps tend to be if there's something conceptually missing, um, and if you can kind of emphasize more that there may be is a conceptual part that by only studying developed countries, you're actually missing out on some of the innovation and development that's happening in developing uh, countries, maybe. Um, so, but I think that's okay. I think that works well. So gap, I think you've done a pretty good job. And then we need to say next to, to the I. So this is going to be your idea or your intervention or what you want to do. So let's see what you're planning to do about it. Um, so we need to get here to say why the case study is going to deal with this. So this, I think, is is not connecting to the gap so much. So there has to be more to the gap. So the what you're saying here is the, the city residents are, uh, to what extent are they satisfied in the planning and design? And how does their perception influence use in the pattern of spaces? A little bit. This seems to me more a question about 
are planners hearing the voices of the citizens who they're trying to help? And your question is more about, you know, how, how do we succeed in designing a, a, a positive uh, public space that's maybe used and people like and people enjoy? Um, not that the planners just said we have to do a recreational space, boom, green space is there, who cares what people think? So I'm not sure, this, this isn't coming across, there's a little bit of a disconnect in saying, well, this hasn't been done in developing countries. I want your gap to be in communication with the idea. So this is this is a little bit uh, of a problem, um, and that that the gap and the idea are not really in, in contact as much as I want them to be. So that makes sense. Your ideal situation is there's this big gaping hole. I'm going to fill this big gaping hole in this way. So I want you to justify why the Algerian context is a good place to study um, the the gap here. So you're talking about the degradation of the in, urban environment, the quantity and quality of public spaces. Um, what is, what is that issue that, when you say few studies in recreational spaces, this is a little bit too vague. Maybe what you want to say instead is that in de developed countries, there's been a big push to hear the voices of the citizens themselves to improve the design of public spaces. In developing countries, I don't know, maybe you want to say governments have been less open or less resistant. Uh, and you want to see to what e extent right, that, that's ha that the governments are listening to the citizens they want to help. So I, I think it just needs to be a little bit reformulation here. Th these are very descriptive uh, questions. And so I, I prefer to see you have, um, you know, this it doesn't, if you answer this question, I, I'm confident you can answer this question. But the problem is, why then does a more international readership care about this? And this is a bigger question for you. If you want to publish in an international high-ranking journal, there needs to be a big conversation going on. This here, if you answer this question, why does somebody in another city want to read this? Um, what has Souk Akras done that's very innovative? Why did you choose this context of Souk Akras? That, that really needs to be explained here. You said it's an example of rapidly growing city. Um, and I think you, you've done a nice job of saying that the lack of the recreational space means that they're doing things that might be un, potentially unsafe um, or, or not good for the community. Um, but I would go a little bit further. Um, just look and see if you have any comments on that um, while I've got the screen up. I hope this makes, makes sense to you. In terms of the writing, because you asked me also about uh, the writing, I think you've got a really nice structure. I think... The two, two things here um, that, that you've done is a really good structure or in the sense that your paragraphs are making uh, one point and they have a good topic sentence. This is a good topic sentence um, that is very clear. So I, I do feel the writing is less the issue in, in this case, but more the content of the research um, to help you publish in high ranking journals. Does that, I hope this makes sense to you before going into some micro edits. You don't see well, um, okay, uh, I'm not seeing any comments. So, Tal, you're, you're saying to you, you don't see well on your cell phone, but I, exactly. So, so Tal, Tal is saying, yeah, like you always say, so what? Exactly. I want to know what the big, imagine your research goes perfectly well and you answer all your questions. Um, it has to answer that question. Tal is saying, so what? Why, why do we care? And sometimes... You guys have a real good answer to it, but you need to articulate that and assume other people are not necessarily going to know. And uh, as you're saying, you learned the outline from, okay, I was going to say, it's a pretty good looking outline. You've done a really nice job with that. Um, so uh, I'm pretty happy with the outline and structure you've got. I would just try to substantively tweak and make this seem a bit higher value. And to me, the value, again, is getting a little bit lost in this tension between do you, do you want to, why why focus on a developing country? Do you want to just focus on expo describing the dynamics of this case study in the city because it's really innovative and it's never been done before and it was a radical experiment, right? That then creates something very interesting to an international audience. Hey, this Souk Aras community did something that nobody's ever done before. The whole world needs to know about it and this is why. And it had tremendous results.
Then you have somebody in New York who wants to read it and say, oh, well, maybe we can we can think about how to design our parks because what they did was so cool. I don't think that's the case there or you would have said so. I think instead what you're trying to do is pull on board uh, the way in which did bring, how did they go about integrating citizens' voices and did that improve uh, the overall result of the project? Yeah, you say you mentioned why, and I don't think anything you said is incorrect. I'm going to try to zoom in a bit. I just don't think it's um, strong enough to publish in uh, in big international journals. Um, that's okay. So right, it's just coming down to your research question. This question here is going to struggle to publish in a high-impact journal. It's not wrong, and I think this is a challenge a lot of students in the group sometimes face. You do great research, everything's perfect, you completely answer the question, and then you go knock on the door at an international journal and you feel like the door is closed. Um, and it often stems not by the quality of the research that you've done, but by the uh, originating question um, that, that you've tried to answer. You've successfully answered. But it, imagine this. I, I have researchers, I remember when I was a PhD as student at Cambridge, and they were looking at the mating patterns of macaws and in, uh, in Latin American countries. And the problem is that it was fascinating research, but only three people in the world cared about it. And they rapidly became some of the best researchers in the world on mating patterns of macaws. The problem is there just wasn't an audience. There wasn't a big debate. So I want you to try to, again, emphasize what is the big debate? This this, you're saying it's situated within these debates, but I I don't see the debate it, it, featuring in here. So, um, again, you've justified the gap, but this idea, the idea is not in touch with the gap. And this debate, we need to have a little more clarity about. Okay, I, I hope that that helps. If, if what you want to do is just get this project done, um, I think it's perfectly viable for that purpose. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, really uh, pleased with the outline that you're doing. Um, I don't think you have to rejig the research. I think it's a bit about how you frame that that research and the value added of that research uh, more. So exactly, say focusing on the housing crisis, um, like you're talking about, is maybe you want to talk about um, how the the government is trying to solve the housing crisis. I, I think there's a big discussion here that the voices of citizens are not being heard. The governments are taking policies and introducing measures and not listening to the people who they want to help. And this happens very often in high income countries and low income countries. And I think your question to me looking at this that I think is personally more interesting doesn't mean it's the right thing for you is I think you have a question, a, a, a big question about civic involvement in designing these public spaces. And that, I think, is what makes this case more innovative. A lot of big international organizations are looking at how do we involve the people themselves? How do we encourage governments to, to develop community responsive planning? And, and those are the kinds of debates and theories I think you want to bring out. Because right now you've kind of just waved your hand and said, ah, oh, yeah, we're going to situate the research in some practical theoretical debates. We, I want to know what those debates are. Why is there a big debate? That's going to help you publish better. It's going to make your research more high impact. And it should make it more fun. Um, so, uh, okay. Glad that's helpful. If I'm not being clear, it doesn't make sense, then I'm not doing my job. Um, again, I don't think it's a major change to the research. Sometimes we can do little tweaks like that that can bring your research to the next level. But day to day, what you're going to go out and do isn't really going to change a whole lot, but it will change how you might present the data and present the results. Um, thanks again for sharing that with us. I know for some of you, it's just kind of nerve wracking to put yourself out there here uh, on YouTube and LinkedIn, Facebook for the world to see, but really appreciate it. It really helps uh, the community who might not benefit from this training otherwise. Um, and again, write to me in the DMs and we can follow up there. Okay. We've also got, uh, I'm going to turn next to uh, a couple questions. That I've got from the community. One is coming from uh, Yiga Patti, PhD student, and says uh, the following, Dear Professor Stockler, when performing a literature review, should it focus on research articles or review articles uh, while gathering data? And then a uh, follow-up question, how should one decide on choosing subheadings within this type of review? Hope to hear from you soon. Best regards. 
Okay, so this is a question I get a lot. Um, what type of literature review should you do? And within that literature review, what articles do you focus on? Um, so, you know, sometimes you hear lots of different terms. There's a systematic review, a scoping review, uh, plain old-fashioned literature review. Which do I need to do? Now, those of you who have followed our community for a while know that whatever field you're in, I strongly advocate for systematic reviews. And what's different about a systematic review from a literature review is, in a literature review, you might go to Google Scholar and just hunt around for articles and gather things until you hit a point of saturation and you get more articles and it doesn't add any value or any additional information to what you're seeing in the literature. Systematic review is going to be different because instead you're going to follow a step-by-step -step process that, uh, as you tell in the community who just published a systematic review, Tal, the steps Tal takes are going to be written up like a recipe for baking a cake so that I could follow Tal's steps, uh, check his assumptions, and come up with the same conclusions Tal did. Uh, and the systematic review is more scientific in that sense in that it aims to achieve reproducibility, that uh, that anybody can, can follow the steps and get the same result, whereas the regular literature review does not. And that's what makes it easier to publish a systematic review, what makes systematic reviews more robust and considered valid, and that's why doctors use them heavily for designing clinical guidelines. Uh, when you go to a doctor and they have a cold and the doctor's deciding what to do, odds are that doctor's not just saying, well, I think we should do this. He's following a step-by-step -step guide that he or she has been trained to do that's emerged from a systematic review that set out a guideline on what is the best practice. Um, and I think it's a valuable tool for anybody to learn because it's a way for you to develop yourself as a scientist to develop good habits for doing research, and those good habits then carry over into any other research that you do. So I strongly recommend doing a systematic review. Side benefits, it's going to give you confidence in, in your research because you're going to have read everything on your topic um, and, and give you a sense of mastery of your field. And one of the biggest challenges students in the group sometimes have is they suffer a bit from what's known as imposter syndrome, where they feel like a fraud, they feel like they don't belong, they're going to get called out, they're going to get kicked out of the program because they're just not good enough. And this is one of the best antidotes to help you gain confidence and take positive steps. It's also often the very first publication, if you've never published before, I think it's the quickest route to your first publication in a high-impact journal. Uh, so uh, that said, um, some of you, that still might not be right. It can take a little bit uh, longer than a literature review. So you need to know the purpose for doing your review. If you really want to go down a, a research path, strongly recommend it. Um, now, these other subtypes. Plain old-fashioned literature review. This can be a great way to quickly identify research gaps and know what's in your field. And you can do, do that much more easily by going to Google Scholar. And we've got a detailed uh, video that I put out, a step-by-step -step guide on doing that traditional old-fashioned literature review of how to search for it, how to extract um, data and results from those literature that you find and make sense out of them using our strip method. Um, if you're interested in that strip method, send me a text, strip, and I will send you a link um, to that article for a traditional literature review in the Facebook group. We've got a step-by-step -step guide for how to do a systematic review. That decision is ultimately yours. Again, my bias, cards on the table. Follow our step-by-step -step guide, do a systematic review if you can. If not, just do a traditional old-fashioned literature review. Oh, and I have my father appearing with some coffee. This is great service, Dad. You're, you're, you're now on uh, YouTube for everybody in the world. Which is, which is awesome. I can tell you, you're really chuffed by that. But um, uh, one of the perks of being uh, home with family at the time is uh, unlimited coffee. Uh, all right. So, uh, guys, I, I, let me just look. I see some of you putting in comments about that. Um, see, um, peer techniques are great. Yeah, peer is pretty awesome on writing, guys. This, when I was a student, I was like, it was like a bomb went off in my world. It just completely changed my writing. And it, it's one of those ideas or systems that once you take it on, you wonder, why did I not, why did, why did I never learn about this? Why did no one tell me this? Um, and it, it, it's really going to help your writing a lot. Um, question, follow-up question. What are the minimum papers required for systematic review? And what are the uh, major steps? Um so usually a minimum, and in, in, in with any review, not just a systematic review, 
If you do a literature review, going back to our macaws example, and there's only two papers published in your field, your field is so narrow, I'm worried about your field. I want you to take a bigger field where there's big active debate. Um, and, and there are multiple reasons for this. If you're in a field with big active debate, there's going to be more jobs. There's going to be more government investment and research in that area. You're in a growing healthy field. If you, right, if you're in a sick field, sick in the sense that there's not much paper, there's not much activity and it's dying, your career is going to be much more difficult. I want you to, and sometimes you do have to make these compromises. Yeah, but I'm really passionate about these macaws. Well, maybe you can broaden the topic to be, I don't know, maybe about birds more generally. I, I don't know. But there's, there's if you can find a way to broaden that conversation, it's going to be better. So if your literature review is only turning up two to three papers, um, to me, that's a sign your field is maybe not that healthy. So you need to broaden your bandwidth. That said, if there's a minimum, if I could draw a hard line on a minimum, to be a review, remember, review is a panoramic sweep. So I would say you need to have about minimum of eight papers for you to say, I'm reviewing a field, a body of research. That applies to systematic review. That applies to literature review. So for a systematic review, like I said, we got our, our step-by-step -step guide. Um, and that really is going to follow a set of steps where you're going to define your topic uh, using tools that we have, such as Pico. If you don't know Pico, don't worry. It's just a tool to help you define your topic. Make sure it's on point. Um, you're going to go to, instead of Google Scholar, you're going to go to databases like Web of Science or PubMed. These are databases that you can search. If you search at a certain date, at a certain time, with certain words, you're going to get the same result every time. So you're going to do steps to define what words you're going to use for the search. Because, for example, I had a student doing a review on alcohol. Well, when people talk about alcohol, they talk about drinking, they talk about booze, they talk about alcohol. So you need to identify all the synonyms of those words to make sure you captured all the relevant articles. Um, and then you're going to load that up, get the articles, and you're going to define your what articles are going to be in, what are going to be out. Set boundaries. And so that setting boundaries is really important. Many students, when they're telling me, oh, I'm going in circles, I'm going in circles, I'm lost, it's because they haven't set boundaries. Right. Boundaries are important in your life in general, but they're super important for your research. Right? Otherwise, right, if, if you don't have boundaries, research can snowball. And I, I remember one student, an older woman, I, I did a call with her and on her desk were literally piles of papers and she couldn't make any sense of the papers, what was in, what was out. And she, no exaggeration, she had mountains of papers, I, I mean, not to mention the consequences for the environment. She was really struggling, and it's because she didn't set effective boundaries. Um, so from that, then, that last step, what you're going to do, then, is you're going to have a systematic way of analyzing. Often our students will create an Excel spreadsheet where they extract the features of the studies. And then they'll analyze and identify the main findings, and only then begin to write up. Um, so writing is often the last step. It's something that causes a lot of anxiety. But if you've done everything right, that writing is the last 10%. And it really falls into place. I've had students tell me, man, I've struggled with writing and I just wrote 2,000 words in, in, in two days. I can't believe it. And that's because all the work that came before to make it possible to write effectively and swiftly happened. Many students are trying to figure things out as they write, which is a strategy, but it can lead to a lot of frustration if not done well. Um, so, um, I got a comment here. I feel like the lack of research on some topics can be used to our benefit. It's easy to report the novelty. And this is a really good point. So, yes, if there's, you, you have to be careful. If there's very limited research on the topic, um, yes. And that's really just defining the gap. So, in the previous paper, we look at the gap is all these studies developing countries, not in developed. Or, sorry, all these studies in developing countries, not in developing. And that still is saying there's a big debate, there's a big conversation, and here's the gap. But if you have, say, there's only been two studies on macaws, and there's all sorts of big gaps on macaws because nobody's looked at it before, and you're going to be the third paper, then I'm worried there's just, you may have novelty, but you need to meet that novelty with a big debate and interest. So that, that's really the balance. You want a big debate, big audience, um, and a big gap. That's kind of your dream situation. Uh, and, and that's hard. That's like hitting a gold mine, hitting the jackpot. 
right? I've got a big conversation, big gap, and I can meet that gap very easily, right? That, that, that's what you want. Um, uh, and Intel's echoing that. Intel, it, it, Patel, I, I think you're by now a group expert because uh, uh, I, I, I feel like you know what I'm going to say most of the time before before I'm going to say it. Um, so we got some other questions that come, but I want to come through the, the other submissions from this week. But I hope that gives you some clarity on when to do a literature review, when to do more systematic review. Um, uh, we could do a whole dedicated session on this, and that's why we have a step-by-step -step guide and training. Um, but generally, those are the principles. The in-between, they're, they're different approaches. And in the context of systematic reviews, uh, Patty also had the question about, should I focus on research articles or review articles? So there's a specialized type of review called an umbrella review in which you do a review of reviews. This is something you, you wouldn't do if you only have two to three papers. You're actually, this is often for a very mature field. We, Courtney, uh, Professor McNamara in the group, together we did an umbrella review of the reviews on the impact of unemployment on health. And this is a huge field of study in social epidemiology that goes back three decades. And we had not just you know, original papers. If we had original papers, we'd have thousands. We included about 12 reviews of reviews. We actually reviewed systematic reviews. That's called an umbrella review because it's overarching. Um, so you do a review of reviews if you have a very big, very mature field. And that's what you choose to do. For most of you, I don't recommend that. That's more advanced move. I don't recommend that as a starting point. Um, what I do suggest you do is only include actual research articles in your reviews, throw out commentaries. You can keep those. They might have interesting things you want to read that help you define the debate, but only focus on original research articles to include in your review is my suggestion. Okay, let me keep going on the, question, uh, on the other questions coming through. We got another one uh, here, and this one's anonymous, and I'm really happy for anonymous questions as well. It says here, um, uh, <laughs> starting, I didn't re expect a response so fast. Uh, I do tend to respond to you guys uh, if you write to me. Um, that's what I'm here for, to help. Okay, and and goes on to say, th this is in regard to the challenge. It's mostly the structure of qualitative and mixed methods paper, writing blockades, a bit also the struggle of academic English as non-native, and I admit that I have a tendency to procrastinate under high stress but then am very productive under the highest pressure, hating myself for being so. I would also be very happy to get some input hands to cope with some of these issues. I also struggle to reach the word limit, and I hope this was not too honest. Uh, no, and, and one of the great things here is that this is a safe space. Right? We're in your corner to help you. And so maybe with your supervisors, you don't want to admit any weakness at all. You don't want your peers to see that you're struggling because uh, you feel you'll get found out. Um, with us, none of those worries. In fact, this is a safe space to bring up these issues. So I'm really glad you shared that with us because I think a, a lot of students feel that. Now, procrastination. Uh, this, there's a good and a dark side to procrastination, uh, right? It, it, some of you have felt that. In procrastination, last minute, adrenaline's going and nothing gets your neurons firing like a last minute deadline. Uh, but it's a long-term that's just not sustainable and it can lead you to burnout. And so for many of you, that may have worked with assignments, but for a behemoth project like a thesis, completely impractical, completely impractical. You need to take, your you're climbing a mountain, you need to break that mountain down into small steps. Um, often I find procrastination is a symptom of something really unpleasant. And that unpleasantness comes from feeling, maybe you don't feel like you know what to do. Uh, maybe you don't have a roadmap and a step-by-step -step guide. Maybe you've had some trauma from it in the past that you've struggled with. But there's often a reason for that procrastination. Uh, procrastination can be so simple as maybe you prefer to go play video games or something else. I don't recommend playing video games. But, you know, maybe there's something else you'd much rather do. In which case, you also need to question is this really the right area for you? Because I only really recommend going down this path if you're really passionate about it, if you get pleasure out of doing it. Um, but for most of you, I'm going to assume that this is the former case and you, you're feeling some procrastination because you're feeling lost. You're not sure what to do. And it's this source of anxiety and a source of unpleasantness. So the very first thing you need to do is make sure you've got a roadmap plan. 
a roadmap you can hold yourself and you can have others hold yourself accountable to. Um, it can be granular to say on a daily basis, I want to do this. It can be more long term. We like to work on three month cycles. So to say, because that's kind of a feasible timeline to get a big project done and make a big step up the mountain. So for example, literature review, systematic review, a good timeline is three months. Within that, um, we've got some really good productivity training on how to structure your days to get there. One of the most important things for you to do is to block off time in your day. You usually have about two blocks in a day, maybe morning, afternoon, of one and a half to two hours that can be really productive. You need to get off socials, completely barricade yourself, maybe get your family to bring you coffee like just happened to me, but don't get in, pulled into social engagement because that's the opposite of what we're used to, right? So often we go get a quick hit of excitement, of news, of something from our phones, and that's reducing our attention spans. You have to work your mental muscles to fight against everything our social environment is training us to do, which is concentrate for one to three hours. And some of you may struggle with that at the beginning. Uh, so once you get in the habit, you will find it deeply satisfying when you get in the flow of deep work. So the very first thing I'd say for procrastination, you need to make a roadmap plan for getting a concrete thing done. And for many of you, that might be a literature review to start out with. From there, then you need to find and protect in your week those blocks of time. To really make that progress, you need to find five to 10 hours per week minimum of protected time. Um, ideally more. Ideally more. Um, and, you know, I don't want this. I've had people come to me saying, you know, uh, uh, Professor Stuckley, you, you've saved my marriage because I was all over the place, riddled with anxiety, not getting anything done. I was accidentally barking at family members while I was working. And that's because you haven't taken the steps to protect your time. You need to do that for your relationships. Barricade yourself away. You need to do that for the product of your research because if you keep getting interrupted, you won't get into deep work. So uh, if you know, that's going to help you fight procrastination. Force yourself to do it. Force yourself to do it. If you're still procrastinating, you get there and you're staring at the wall, it's probably because you don't have a step-by-step -step plan. And you need to develop that. We can help you develop a step-by-step -step plan. Um, your supervisors can help you with that. That's your first port of call. Second thing, um, English. You need a system to work with. If you are not a native English speaker, you have an extra challenge. And we need to separate working on the English from working on the science. What helps a lot of our non-native English speakers is to go through some of our writing training you can find freely available in the group and work from a system. Because that's gonna take some of the anxiety and frustration about learning scientific writing away. You need to make writing as easy as possible for as a non-native English speaker by understanding good scientific writing. And that's gonna enable you to focus on the English. Now, there are some tools that help you with English. Grammarly is a very good one. Uh, some of the deep translator tools, now AI powered, make that also easier than ever before to get that right. But it's no substitute for learning scientific writing. That's something that you need to do and uh, it's indispensable. You can sometimes get away with not being a good writer uh, if, if English is your native language, but it still creates problems in clarity and communication. Um, so follow our peer system. I'm gonna put it in the chat, uh, peer system for academic writing. You can find a live video where we go through it uh, on, on the YouTube channel and in the Facebook group, we've got more detailed uh, trainings on, on peer and that's gonna really, really help you. That's, that's the first training. We've got other trainings uh, that are gonna be valuable to you, but that's if you could only do one, that's the one I want you to start with. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, I, ha I have a comment from the group who's been struggling with procrastinating, I can't live a normal life. Exactly. This is the thing. You, research is a part of your life. It's not your whole life. So I want you to, to gain control of your life back and put in place some of these planning principles for, for your schedule, or you, you really will set yourself up on a burnout cycle. And too many students come to me when it's too late saying, oh, I just want to quit. And it's gone too far. So, um, you know, if you feel like you can't live a normal life, uh, you're you're on the cusp of a burnout and that is, there's no way that that's going to be sustainable uh, going forward. Okay. I'm going to turn to uh, looking at the linear regression, uh, but I am going to come back to your, your comments and questions. So, so don't worry about that. Um, uh, they're all valuable to me. So bear with me and we'll get to the end. 
I want to come to this linear regression uh, because this is something a lot of you uh, uh, use as a method and struggle with. And so um, here, I asked a student, a student wanted some help in linear regression and sent this to me. Now, by the way, we do have chats in the group. So we have a quantitative chat, we have a lit review chat, a systematic review chat, and an academic writing chat. And that's a great way to get in touch, not just with me, but the entire community, uh, where if you have a challenge, you get an answer like this. And it's not just for me, but experts in the group like Tal, uh, other professors like Professor McNamara, um, we'll get back to you. So do take advantage of that resource. Okay, so this came out of that, the quantitative channel. And it looks like it was just sent kind of a dump of output from, uh, from a quantitative regression. Now, with any method, you need to have clarity about the research question you're trying to answer. And so what I often want to see in quantitative analysis or, or any research generally is something called a DAG. I want to see, right, um, right, otherwise you get this data and you don't know how to make meaning out of it. I want to see what you're testing. So usually you have something in regression that you think is related to something else. Well, I want you to set out the causal logic of how you think that's related. Maybe I think poverty is going to increase the risks of HIV spreading. And maybe I could even, and that's just cutting off the screen, but okay. Um, maybe I could even detail that further. Let me let me erase that and say, okay, I think poverty is going to lead to to people um, maybe entering the sex trade. That's going to increase the risks of HIV. Or maybe you think poverty is going to lead to more injection drug use, right? Unsafe needles, and that's going to lead to HIV. And th these might be different reasons why poverty causes HIV, uh, and you test both. This is something that's called a DAG, right? And that can make, I don't know why researchers love acronyms. They create their own special language, insider language, so that they can recognize who's an insider, who's an outsider, and make themselves feel special. But anyway, it means directed acyclic graph. To me, it's just a logic model or a flow diagram. But I want you to have this kind of, it's so simple, but I want you to have this kind of simple clarity about what you're trying to do in your quantitative research. You're going to need that to interpret what comes next. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down to the main results of this and see if I can make it. Now, my French is kind of limited. I speak Italian, but my French isn't great. And all sorts of things here. And I'm not going to worry uh, too much about this. And there's some regression diagnostics and tools. I'm not going to go into that. But here's what's going on. It looks like they've done a regression, which just looks at the satisfaction level of urban physical attributes. And this is linked to our earlier paper uh, proposal. So I guess this is asking people in a survey, how satisfied are you about your neighborhood? And what's the outcome? Place perception. We don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. Okay. So this is really unclear. I think when you have two variables like this, one of the big value of linear regression is that it can control for alternative possibilities. So say there's poverty, but maybe uh, another factor is that they, they um, I don't know, they smoke right? And people are poor or smoke, you want to make sure smoking is not explaining the risk of HIV. Maybe it's people who smoke of HIV. Don't know. So in, in regression, you can test poverty, but you can also try to compare um, for how smoking may or may not play a role. And then you can say, no, if somebody says, no, I think your results are just, it's not actually poverty, it's smoking. You say, no, we actually looked at that, we tested that, and we found, no, it wasn't smoking. So you want to do that. And that can be, that's something called multiple, I'm sorry, bad handwriting, linear regression. But you know, I don't think you really need that here. Um, I think you're just looking at two variables. So I need you to go back and give me clarity. I'm going to recreate your DAG. And I don't want you guys to just blindly jump in and do analyses. I want you to know why you're doing these analyses. So it looks like what you've done is you have your outcome is place perception, which is a little un unclear. And then you have kind of satisfaction here. So to me, this already looks a little bit backwards because isn't, is, I, th I would think satisfaction is the outcome. You want, you want people to be more satisfied with their environment. 
So already from looking at this, I think you have, and I don't mean to offend you, I think you have this backwards. I think it's the other way around. That, so that you want, we want to erase satisfaction here. Whoops. I don't know what, I didn't want to be pink, but that's very cute. Uh, and switch it the other way. I think you want satisfaction here. I'm just going to put status there. And you place perception here. But still, I don't understand the research question. And that, that really comes back, I think, to the original proposal we were looking at. I think this link to that original proposal, unless we have two on the same topic, because it came anonymized. So, um, so again, if you don't have the clear research question, it's going to carry all the way through to, to your research. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking at this. I still don't get the research question. Sorry. But I think the causal logic is backwards. So I would really encourage you to make a DAG and then we can interpret it. But if you just want to go, right, I can interpret this for you, but it doesn't really help us. This is just saying for each one unit, and we don't know what that is, maybe it's scaled from one to five. So each one unit rise in higher satisfaction level is associated with an 0.96 rise in place perception. We don't know how that's scaled either. Um, and there appears to be a, a strong association, um, which you can see by this T value. But that doesn't really, it's very hard uh, for us to interpret that without the research question, without the context. Last thing, when you have two variables, I recommend instead just plot them. Just plot them against each other. And then you can get a graph that looks something like this. That's much more informative than just a coefficient, because that coefficient is just telling us the slope. It's kind of minimizing the distance of the dots from the line. Um, so just... That slope doesn't help us. Actually, there's a lot of information. Why is there a dot way out here? Why is there a dot way out there? Sometimes those are good ways to find case studies and different things you can do for further investigation. Why are some following the trend? Some are bucking the trend. Um, those are things you want to know. So this goes to the same principle. Before interpreting your data, you need to have clarity about your research question and you need to have a framework for understanding it. Whether you're doing qualitative or quantitative analysis, those are just tools. I want you to have the clarity um, to make the best use of those tools. The tools are kind of your servants. They're working for you. Too often I see students saying, oh, I did this regression and this is cryptic. I don't know what it means. Uh, you can take back control on that and get your clarity first and then employ the tools to serve you as you try to answer your big question. Hope that makes sense, and I hope that helps. I'm going to come off and take a uh, circle back and take our last uh, questions here uh, on the regression. Can't see the pic. That's clear. Oh no, uh, you didn't. You didn't see it. Shoot, guys, shoot. You didn't see it. Um, this is the problem where I don't have multiple screens. Um, oh shoot. I'm so sorry about this, guys. That uh, didn't didn't work the way I planned here. I'm just going to recap this here. And let's see if this will share. Okay. All right, guys. I'm pulling this back. And now you can see the scribbles that I did. Okay. Sorry about this. Well, um, basically, what I was saying is the X and the Y um, got flipped. So just to very quickly recap, um, what I'd done is I went through and uh, found there was just this output spit out here. And we had a satisfaction level here. Um, which was looked like the association and satisfaction level on um, place perception. And what I said is that I think that the X and Y are flipped, that this is, this is the DAG here. And the way that this was set up was that you had the satisfaction here linked to place perception. I think instead satisfaction, they meant to be the outcome. So I think these need to be flipped around. So this is a DAG is creating this kind of logic flow model, setting out your hypothesis. I gave the example of uh, poverty and uh, HIV. So um, right, you might have poverty, you might think is linked to HIV risk. Um, but then you might decide, oh, well, I want to break this down further. And I think maybe poverty is linked to, uh, say, somebody being forced to go into the sex trade like this. Risk of HIV, maybe you think another route or mechanism here could be drug use. Um, that can lead to HIV. Um, so when you have multiple regression, you can control for other things like smoking that could maybe 
muddy the waters and people could criticize you say oh i actually you found this link between poverty and hiv i actually think smoking is the cause multiple regression helps you deal with that if you're just dealing with two variables i think it's much easier to make a graph like this and then you can look at these points and see who's on the trend who's bucking the trend very quick synopsis there but all the other points apply here you, you need this kind of a framework to help you and thanks for pointing that out guys i i'm off-site so i don't have my multiple monitors so i can see your chat and the comments here at the same time so air is human uh i make mistakes thanks for bearing with me but i hope that's clear clear now um but other than that we didn't do a deep interpretation um because really uh, the, this to me just spitting out the results like this absent a framework tells me that there's some deeper confusion going on behind that has nothing to do with the technical execution of the linear regression itself um, um but yeah uh, we can interpret the, these coefficients here and their significance and do lots with that but what's more important is to get this logic and the research question clear um and it can lead to things like what i think is going on not any offense that the the outcome or dependent variable is getting mixed up with the independent or explanatory variable here okay uh, let me come back does that, does that make sense, guys? You can see the screen now. Okay. Um, okay. All, all good now. Cool. Uh, thanks for bearing with me, guys. Okay. I'm going to take these last questions, and then we're going to call it for today. Mm. All right. So we've got... Um, uh, let's see here. Um And oh, I see on this, someone is saying that satisfaction is a prerequisite to positive or negative perception. The problem here is this is just not, it, it depends what you want to do. If you just need to tick a box and publish something or complete something from your program, that's okay. But saying satisfaction, I'm more satisfied with my physical space and that's linked to a more positive perception of my space. One, it's not very exciting. And two, people will say, well, that's kind of obvious. And isn't that a bit circular in the sense that well, you, if you're more satisfied, you have more positive perception. It's not really clear what what's the debate or burning question there. If that makes sense. You you've shown something that that people would just again ask that question. Tal said is well, so what? And and I don't think that that is linked to what you're passionate about and what your big idea or big question is. So I really want you to go take a step back and, and work on that a bit. But from what I can see, actually implementing the regression and implementing the method is fine. Uh, but the, there's a bigger conceptual question there. I hope that helps. Um, okay. So, oh, sorry, guys. I'm really sorry that I, I mucked that up. Um, okay. Can I share my research pro, uh, proposal? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. That's what this session is for. I uh, would love having your submissions. If you're happy to share with the community, you benefit from the whole of the community giving you feedback. And we have many students uh, who go later say, oh, I'm working on the same area. Get in touch around the world. It's truly an international community. And it's really awesome. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely share it and use our gift method. I didn't get through the F and the T, which are feasibility and timeline. I just covered the gap in idea because those were the big things for the proposal that I saw there. But um, we've got a great tra training in the group on our gift method. You can find it on the YouTube channel as well. Don't want to miss that. I mean, I've won over $10 million in competitive grant funding. And right, these tools and techniques that I've developed come directly from my experience. Uh, and they've helped a lot of my students over the years at, at Harvard, Cambridge, and Oxford. So let, let me come here and take, oh, this is a long one. I'm going to have to uh, read this too because the whole comment won't come up. Would you be kind enough to suggest a way to doing secondary research around the following? How do cognitive and cultural biases impact the way in which academics interpret academic integrity policies? Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a really, really nice question. I mean, there's a discussion now, especially, I like pinning this to a contemporary discussion, for example, on plagiarism. There's now conversation about chat GPT and plagiarism. And you can see, potentially, different cultures are looking at this and approaching it in different ways. So you need to get a little bit of clarity on which academic integrity you want to focus on. I think that's really important. And then the cognitive and cultural biases, you then need to, to get clarity on how to test that. There are different ways of testing biases. Biases by, by their nature are sometimes hidden and not easy to see. So in the medical field, what they, they've done, they've even used actors. So they would go in and have 
say a 50 year old male, one who is white and one who is non-white, go in, present the same symptoms and see if the doctors uh, get, came up with a different conclusion with the only thing that they changed being the, the color of their skin. And they actually found that non-white people were less likely to get prescribed costly interventions. Um, and they concluded this was a subconscious bias. And the doctors were not actively racist, but there was a hidden subconscious embedded racism. Um, so there are things like that that you can do. So you could put a, another way you could do this is you have the policy. You could do interviews with people across different cultures and ask for their interpretation. Um, that would be one simple, straightforward way to do this. Uh, I would encourage you to, though, to get clarity on the policies you want to look at and the biases you want to look at. But I think it's a really fantastic question. The second research question that you have, um, and again, there's not one right or wrong way to go about doing that research, um, but uh, uh, that's there. So how do these biases affect student outcomes? Yeah, so if you're interested in student outcomes, you, so, so the, the, the uh, our, our student here in the group says, I had a second research question was how do these biases affect student outcomes and goes on to say they're thinking about halo effect, confirmation bias. <coughs> um, I would focus on the first for now. Focus on the first and then once you get a method iron out for that, then you can think of those second order questions. I do like that you prioritize the first order question as this, second order. I think you'll be able to deal with the second order once you get that, that first one dealt with. So don't worry too much about that yet. I think it, you you asked too, could you tackle this through ethnographic research? So ethnographic research is maybe, there's different ways of doing it. Um, oftentimes you might be a, an observer and uh, kind of uh, watching what people do and how they interact with things. I think it would be hard to do that way, but you can definitely do interviews with people at maybe different points in the university hierarchy at different universities. Um, I think it, the most helpful way, if you want to, test out a cultural bias is to have the same policy in different places and see how, how that's referred to, um, if that makes sense. Um, my, my initial reaction is um, some short interviews or surveys would be the best way to go for that. Uh, other question we got here, um, how can we succeed in the academic research career? Well, yeah, that's a million dollar question. Uh, that's what everybody wants to know. Um, look, there, there's no shortcuts, but there are some more efficient routes. And I think if you really want to succeed, it's really kind of straightforward. You need to publish, and then you need to cash in on those publications and get grant funding. That doesn't go for all fields, but that formula works for about 70, 80% of the fields that are out there. Uh, so I encourage you to really focus on publishing. The, one of the great things about the university sector is it is more meritocratic than other areas of work. That is, if you work hard and you publish, you will do well. The kind of goalposts are clear. If you publish consistently in top journals, you will get a good academic job. And so there's clear, there's clear performance metrics and clear targets. If you get a big grant for several million dollars, right, you can't buy your way into universities as a student. Although there's debates about some places. Uh, but um, you can, in, in research, if you go knock on, I don't know, let's say uh, uh, Liverpool University and say, hey, I've got a three million grants. Can we completely pay my salary and research team? They'll, they'll roll out the red carpet for you. I'm not picking on Liverpool, but a lot of universities are like that. They want funding. They want top researchers. So uh, you want a competitive uh, academic research career. The first and most important thing you can do right now is publish, publish consistently and develop that skills. If you've never published before, I recommend again a systematic review, and that will put you on the path to success, getting mastery, and getting recognized as an expert in your area. Okay, that, thanks for asking that. Um, on the issue of systematic review and literature, which is more acceptable, or are they the same in terms of acceptability? Um, uh, it depends. For publishing, um, to publish, uh, I think you need to do a systematic review. It's, it's that simple. It's much harder to publish a regular literature review. So um, they're, they're definitely not. Um, so I would focus on that. Um, and let's see how to handle the, the negative progress review. So you want to go as far as possible to address your supervisor's comments. 
If they're saying you're not making progress, we need to know why. Is it you've had a relationship breakdown with your supervisor? Is it you don't feel like you know what to do? Is it you don't have a roadmap plan and you've been procrastinating like we covered earlier? Um, so this is kind of your first warning. Hey, something's not working here. Great. I want you to come back and completely address and assuage all the concerns that they had about the progress review that, that you've got a clear plan for rectifying the situation. Um, because what can happen is you can end up being the student in the department that nobody wants to touch. Like, oh, the student's a mess, too difficult, don't want to work with them. And I don't want you to get tarred with that stain. So um, maybe get in touch with us and give us a little more clarity on what's going on there. And then we can we can help you. Um, is there any way to join the Fast Track group other than using Facebook? Um, you know, we, we put, unfortunately, that group functionality doesn't quite exist in the same way on other platforms. So we've used Facebook. Uh, I've thought about maybe creating a Discord group. Um, but get in touch with me, Grace, and we can definitely explore the options. I know some of you may not want to use Facebook because you get distracted. Lots of your friends get on there. And uh, I, I get that. Um, but at the moment, that that's our main platform. Uh, although I am open to suggestions. If there's something you'd like to see, I do, do listen to you. Um, so I've missed a conversation here going on about a Stanford issue. Uh, Tal, you may have to relay that to me later. And, um, and then finally, I'm going to take uh, a couple last questions, and then we're going to call it. Oh, a lot of you guys are asking a question that we had. What type of review for early career researchers? Again, guys, I, I'm very consistent in this. I recommend a systematic review. 100% all day. Answer's not going to change. So um, unless something in the field changes, then, then you know, right, as the economist Kane said, when the facts change, I change my mind. I don't see those facts changing anytime soon. Uh, I think that's 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 the answer. Um, Tal's going back to the earlier research question. Can work as an experiment? Yeah, um, exactly. That experiment with the actors. You, you could present a policy. You could even invent a policy. Here's a policy. What do you think about this? Um, you could uh, you could do many things to work with the design. And I would encourage you to get in touch with Tal. You can find Tal as one of our experts in the Facebook group. Um, and uh, he's also in our group chats. So definitely join there. Grace, great to see that you're a able to work with that. Um, when you say, and this is a good question on the systematic review, it's not acceptable. Well, all of you have to do a literature review. So if you do that literature review as a systematic review, then, uh, then that's fine. It just depends what you want to do. So uh, some universities want three published papers. Sometimes those papers, one of them can be a systematic review, sometimes not. But either way, of those three published papers, you've got to do a literature review. So my suggestion is always just do it in a systematic way. In my experience, it's easier for most students if they have step-by-step -step training and it's faster. Um, so uh, that's what I recommend. If you're saying that it's not acceptable because it must be original research, well, your literature review is not going to count as one of your papers, no matter what you do. So, but you still will need to do a literature review um, as a researcher. And I think sometimes when students come to me and the questions are not clear or they're not really high value gaps, sometimes to me it's also a sign that they haven't done a really good literature review beforehand. Um, they don't really have the mastery of their field to see where the gaps are, where kind of the currents in, in those ocean waters of the research field are moving. Um, and I would take that time to try to identify a really important gap in your field. We've actually got a training in ChatGPT where we use ChatGPT. We pop in the field and say, hey, what's a big gap in this area? That, that uh, That's an area that I could publish on and develop an academic career. And that can be a way for those of you who don't have expert supervisors to get immediate feedback on your gap and get some generate some ideas if you're starting from zero. Um, we've got, again, that dedicated chat GPT training goes through that and more in the right and wrong way to use chat GPT. You get a lot of value out of that and it could definitely be useful for just being a sounding board to see if you found a good gap. But I definitely recommend everybody, everybody doing research needs to do a literature review. I'll leave you with take a message. My take is make that review a systematic review. Um, so you can publish, feel confident, 
and get it done in an efficient time. Guys, that's a wrap for today. We've gone just over an hour. We're going to do these more regularly. So you know how to get in touch with me. I'm in the DMs. You can also email me at davidstuckler at fasttrackgrad.com. I love hearing from all of you. Thanks to those of you who shared your questions and contributed to the community. Like any community, you get what you put in. And it really is designed to serve all of you. And so if you do know others who haven't joined us, but uh, think could benefit and might be missing out, let them know what we're doing. Uh, we do want to grow and serve as many grads uh, and researchers across the world as we can to really democratize and make open access those secrets of the ivory tower that were passed on to me, that I pass on to my students. I think education needs change. And I hope this community is one step in the right direction of making equal access, open access, uh, that dream a reality for, for all. Um, great to see that you guys have gotten value out of this. And uh, that's exactly why we do do these sessions. So uh, have a great week, every, everybody. And uh, we'll be in touch in the DMs. And uh, I'll talk to you then.